So, Clarity, what stereotype do you think you live up to? I'm American, so mm -hmm. we're loud and opinionated. I would say I live up to that. Mm -hmm. I work in tech, so I'm a geek. I like Star Trek and Star Wars. I'd say I probably live up to that. I'm supposed to be a shock jock, but I actually hate the term. Oh, Because okay. it kind of insinuates that I tell lies just to get a reaction. Oh, exciting. But I don't, but I actually believe everything I say. So I don't think I live up to the stereotype of being a shock jock. But I do live up to the stereotype. I'm probably very conservative ah, in see. my views. Interesting. Yeah. Well, some people call that moralistic. My first impressions of Niall is that he's differently minded than myself, but well expressed. In addition to being a tech geek, I'm also a professional dominatrix. I probably look a bit like it. OK, <laughs> and when you say a professional dominatrix, mm -hmm. are, you, are you a sex worker? I consider myself a sex educator. By definition, dominatrices are sex workers. When I first started, I, I would say, no, 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 I'm, I don't have sex for money. But I realize now, as time goes on, that it's good to destigmatize sex work as a whole. It's the world's oldest profession, and will continue on long after myself, and we all are gone. Is it really that popular? I mean, in Ireland, because we're quite backward, aren't we? I mean, when it comes to sex, we don't like to talk about it very much. Yeah, it's massively popular here. It's actually massively popular all over the world. I know, I, you, you're not going to catch me in a gimp suit or anything, <laughs> <laughs> or anything like that. Never dined with a dominatrix and probably never will again, to be honest with you. Look, it's not my bag. Um, each to their own, wherever floats your boat. I, I just think it's strange, the idea of people dressing up in gimp suits and whipping each other. And have you ever spoken to these guys that w want to do that really weird stuff? What's really weird? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they want people to stamp on their penis and <laughs> bonkers stuff, like. It gets to the level where people are stamping on people's penises or, or yeah. people want to be fed like babies and yeah. put nappies on them. I just think, I just think there's something messed up about it. Mm -hmm. something, there's something wrong with the person. Maybe they need some you know, intervention. You mean it, it, it's harmful to them? Well, yeah, well, I think they need psychological intervention. There's a very fine line between pleasure and pain. I don't know how you could get sexual pleasure out of pain. That's a type of play called impact play, which is hitting somebody with anything. Could be your hand, mm -hmm. could be an instrument. But it's a fine line between control and domestic abuse. Absolutely, but the fine line is the only line that actually matters, which is consent. But if somebody said, say a woman, for yeah, example, yeah. consented to be choked, yeah. does that make it acceptable because she's consenting to be choked? Yes. Well, well no, I don't think it's okay for anybody to be choked, even if they, if they consent to it, because it could be dangerous. I mean, if, if it's a dangerous yeah. act, that could yeah. have risk involved. Yeah. I didn't agree with her. I believe that once you're heading into a, a route where you know things are quite dangerous or can put somebody in danger, you're venturing into something very different. Apart that, it's not a sexual fetish anymore. There's lots of other flavors that would look much more like so that's impact play or like um, degradation, humiliation. That's what you know Hollywood and TV teaches humiliation. us about it. Explain it. Okay, so humiliation. Give me an example of humiliation. Simulation, like an example would be name calling. Okay. Or things like, uh, for example, cuckolding would be a form of okay. humiliation, degradation. And from an outsider looking in, you would see, uh, say, a husband and wife, and the husband enjoys watching his wife sleep with other people. Is that not a bit messed up? Really, because if you're in a loving relationship, why, do you, why would you want to see your wife having sex with somebody else? But why wouldn't you? Because I thought that's what marriage was all about, was exclusivity, intimate exclusivity to each other. But why? But it's just open relationships <laughs> and that kind of stuff just wouldn't appeal that's to a, me at all. That's the <laughs> definition of it. I mean, like, the idea I, is, I, like, I, I love and care about that person. I, would, I am invested in their pleasure as much as they are. I personally believe it's disrespectful. I couldn't have my partner there and being intimate with somebody else while I watched. I just think it's disrespectful to the institution of not only marriage, if you're married to somebody, but to your partner. I think that would just cause immense problems within a relationship, yeah. emotionally. And it can, but I mean, that would imply that like jealousy is a dynamic that's at play. So for example, I've been married for the last five years to an Irish person and okay. he and I play together in this space as well. We play together, we play separately, and for both of us... So could he watch you having sex with He does, else? yeah. And does that not piss him off? No, he's a good sport. He, he, and I watch him having sex. I think he was a bit repulsed and possibly shocked. I get that a lot. Should sex education be taught in primary schools? I would say no. Why? You don't talk to children about sexual relationships. You just don't. They're not going to be having sex. Wow. You can talk about consent, you know, in general terms, about everything, yes. not just sex, about yeah, yeah. permission. Everything, absolutely. Yeah, about permission and giving people their space, et cetera, et cetera. And I understand nowadays that it's a very different time to when I was a child and children have access to pornography a lot quicker than they had. I think it's very damaging to children. I believe that the sooner that we teach children about sex and uh, reproduction and reproductive rights and sexual orientations, the better. 
If we don't get in front of the narrative, they will find another source, and it's not gonna be a source that we like. What about the, the human body, like eggs, sperms, or like this is a naked no. adult no, female body, this is a naked adult no. male body? No, it's no. seven or eight years of age, no. Why? It's unnecessary, they don't need to know about it. If you don't teach them, they will find the information some other way, so would you rather have it administered? I don't believe it's the state's responsibility, I believe it's a parent's responsibility. I would like to think that the majority of parents are good parents and know their child. So I don't believe it's up to the state to use a, a blunt instrument to teach children at that age. You don't have to go into the details of Mammy sticks his penis and Mammy's vagina, not to a seven-year-old. It's completely inappropriate. I just think if we got in front of the argument versus letting them discover it on porn... Well, if you let your seven-year-old discover sex on porn, you're a bad parent. And I just think getting in front of it means that we can control the message better. There's a funny meme, which is like, people these days talk about sex too much, and then it's an Irish family with like, you know, 18 kids. <laughs> that generation is thankfully starting to transition out and younger, more open-minded perspectives are starting to creep in, thankfully. What is your biggest regret in life? Do you want me to go first? Or <laughs> yes, do you, yes, Or do you please. want to tackle this one? No, I've, no, I've had a few ahead. of them. <laughs> I, I'm a quite insecure person. I'm very insecure, I went to, years of torment, I mean, in school because I was bullied quite badly. Mm. I ended up with alopecia at the age of seven, mm. where I lost all my hair, eyebrows, gone. And this is hair replacement. So I lost, then once that happened, I got bullied even more for not having any hair. I ended up with this kind of massive insecurity. Yeah. And because of that, I, I worry about too many things. Yeah. I worry about everything. Yeah. I just, and I worry unnecessarily. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. What's your biggest regret? Oh, I think for myself, I uh, lived for other people for a long time, and I did that at the expense of myself. So much like yourself, I had bills to pay and mouths to feed and worked mm. 80 or 90 hour work weeks, and I ran myself ragged. And also, I realized that I was enabling bad behavior and so recently restructured those relationships. They're still very close, we still love each other, but they're less codependent mm. and they're doing better than ever, ever thought possible. So, so you were living your life for other people? Vicariously through other yeah. people. Uh, do you think, sorry for interrupting, no, but do you okay. think that's the reason you do what you do? I'm so glad you asked. And actually I would say that's how it started. So I was sexually assaulted as a teenager. I'm sorry to hear that. I came from a kind of hippie family. They named me Clarity. It's an unusual name. Yes. <laughs> very supportive parents. We're all very close. I'm very open and they know what I do. But I found myself having a hard time reconciling myself back to sex. And so I found, in the early days of the internet, the kink community, which was all about consent and communication and power exchange, where women could find roles to get their voices back in their power. And I found it to be so therapeutic and cathartic for me. Well, the reason I do it still is because, other than the fact that it's super fun, is um, because I like helping people. I found it to be really powerfully transformative and, mm -hmm. and therapeutic, actually, in a way that, like no amount of talk therapy can really do. I do think it's a huge part of my overall transformation process and has allowed me to, to be as passionate as I am today about helping people. I wouldn't prescribe it for everybody, but I definitely think it was um, cathartic, and he was very, very courteous in receiving that story. I have the power. I reclaim my personal power. And but I'm... does it not take you back to the, the point where you were sexually assaulted? Does no, because I know? changed the ending. So now I'm the one in control. Now I'm the one who has the power. So you can make it stop anytime you want. Absolutely. I think we both had a common ground there where we both had an insecurity from our backgrounds. And we're both very insecure people by the sounds of it. You wouldn't think that to listen to the two of us talking, mind you. But we're both quite insecure people. <laughs>